With the current COVID-19 global pandemic, I thought it would be relevant to make a short video giving a very introductory level explanation of what viruses are. So let's begin with the most obvious question. What is a virus? A virus is defined as a super tiny infectious particle that can reproduce only by infecting a host cell. But then viruses are often confused with bacteria. And even though they both make us sick, bacteria and viruses are very different at the biological level. Bacteria are small and single-celled, but they are living organisms which don't depend on a host cell to reproduce. They're able to do this on their own. Also, bacteria are so much larger than viruses. When you look at the diameter of a typical virus, which is about 20 to 30 nanometers, while an E. coli bacterium has a diameter of about 1,000 nanometers, bacteria is almost giant-like in comparison. There's so many different types of viruses on our planet Earth, which also means that viruses vary in different features like size, shape, and life cycle. But there are always some things that remain in common, and these features include a protective protein shell, or capsid, a nucleic acid genome made up of DNA or RNA, which is found tucked inside of the capsid, and then a layer of membrane that's called the envelope. So let's take a closer look at all of these features. The capsid is also known as the protein shell of a virus, and it's made up of protein molecules. Capsid proteins are always encoded by the virus genome. This means that the virus provides the instructions that are needed to make them. Capsids are also found in many different forms, but some of the most common ones are icosahedral, which is named after the 20-sided shape called an icosahedron, helical, which is named after its linear, thin, thread-like appearance, and prolate. And this is kind of a hybrid between the helical and icosahedral shapes. As for the genetic material or the genome of a virus, we know that it's made up of nucleic acids. So the same way that we and all other cell-based life use DNA as their genetic material, viruses can actually either use RNA or DNA, both which are types of nucleic acid. And in previous courses, you may have learned that RNA is single-stranded and DNA is double-stranded, since that's the case in our cells. But in reality, viruses can have all different possible combinations of strandedness and nucleic acid types. So while there are single-stranded RNA and double-stranded DNA, there's also double-stranded RNA and single-stranded DNA. Now, some viruses also have an external lipid membrane that's known as the envelope, which surrounds the entire capsid. Viruses with these envelopes don't encode for them. Instead, they borrow a patch from the host membrane when they exit cells following infection. However, the envelopes do have proteins which are specified by the virus, which often help them bind to host cells. So in everyday life, we talk about viral infections as these nasty symptoms we get when we catch the flu or the chicken pox, but what's actually happening in your body? Well, at the microscopic level, a viral life cycle is just set up steps in which the viral recognizes and enters the host cell, reprograms the host by providing instructions in the form of viral RNA or DNA, and then uses the host resources to make even more viral particles. So for a typical virus, we can divide its life cycle into five broad steps. So let's talk about each of these five steps. So at attachment, what happens here is the virus recognizes and binds to a host cell through a receptor molecule on its cell surface. And then the next step is entry. So the virus or its genetic material enters the cell. Next, you have genome replication and gene expression. The viral genome will be copied, and then its genes are expressed to make viral proteins. So after that, you have assembly. New viral particles will be assembled from the genome copies and the viral proteins expressed in the previous step. Finally, we have release. Once the viral particles have been assembled, the completed particles will exit the cell and can infect other cells. Although we've only been talking about viruses in regards to how it infects cells, viruses can also be used in a lot of novel applications. In other words, viruses aren't always so bad. For example, viral vectors are a type of tool that are designed to deliver genetic material into cells. At this point, we've already discussed that viruses are capable of transporting their genomes inside the cells that they infect. This was the first step of their life cycle. So imagine if we took this first step and manipulated it to modify viruses to safely deliver any gene that we wanted into host cells. Viral vectors were originally developed to transfer naked DNA into cells in molecular experiments. But let's think bigger. Viral vectors can be used for gene therapy. This is a technique for correcting defective genes that are responsible for disease development. In the future, gene therapy could even provide a way to cure certain genetic disorders. Because these diseases result from mutations in the DNA sequence for specific genes, Gene therapy trials have used viruses to deliver unmutated copies of these genes to the cells of patients. Bacteriophages, or just phage, are viruses that infect and destroy specific bacteria. 
Recent research studies suggest that phages that are present in the mucus are part of our natural immune system and they protect our bodies from invading bacteria. So phages have actually been used to treat dysentery, salmonella infections, and skin infections for nearly a century. Early sources of phages for therapy included local water bodies, dirt, air, sewage, and even body fluids from infected patients. The viruses were isolated from these sources, purified, and then used for treatment. Phages have attracted renewed interest as we continue to see the rise of drug-resistant infections. This just goes to show that the things that make viruses the bad guys can also be manipulated for good.